coming here, I decided to Google the title of my talk, The Power of Voice. And most of the outcomes that pop up were about voice recording software or some about voice uh, recognition. But the vast majority was about how to succeed in public speaking. So they have this kind of advice. Uh, look, uh, be careful how you look, how to dress up. Uh, they give you advices such as uh, choose the appropriate tone so you inspire confidence and authority. Well, that's pretty egomaniac, by the way. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's certainly not what I want to talk about. All what I want to do today is to share with you some of the things that I've learned throughout my life about power and voice. In May 1990, uh, I was about to vote my first time. But I realized at that moment that not everything that happened to us is because we decided. Many important things come to us just by chance. So for example, in my country, two out of 10 children are born in rural areas coming from indigenous or African descendant families. There are only two out of the 10 in the whole population. But if you look at the figures of children affected by violence, then you find out that six out of the 10 children whose families have been affected by horrible crimes such as massacres or selective homicides or forced displacement come from these kind of families. So these children, without nothing, have three more times chances to be affected by this kind of violence. So yeah, definitely we are not all about you know, being smart, but sometimes we are just looking. The second thing is that probably because of different chances, we have different opportunities. So let's come back to an example. For example, education. 10 out of the 10 children in my country have the chance to get some basic education. Uh, so that's pretty spread and available in general. But unfortunately, only roughly seven are able to finish high school. And then only two out of the 10 are able to earn a bachelor's degree. And a lighty, tiny, sort of 0.02% are able, are able to go up to the doctoral level. So yes, sure, you know, formal education is not for everybody, and it is not the best way to succeed in life, necessarily. But the fact is that roughly 4 million Colombian teenagers that wanted to go to a university couldn't go because they didn't find a place or because they didn't have the money, but that's different. So there are many things in life that just come to us by chance because we are just fortunate enough to have them, right? But there are other things that actually we choose that change our lives, our, our way of thinking or living or feeling. That happens to me in May 1990. I was about to vote by first time. I was pretty excited. I always loved politics since the very beginning of my life. It was a clear discussion at the table at my home. And finally, I was about to start my adulthood and to be able to exercise my freedom of speech and my right to choose who to vote for. Out of the candidates, I was looking closely to three. One of them was Bernardo Jaramillo, the other one was Carlos Pizarro, and the other one, was Luis Carlos Galán. As you could see, they were all vibrant candidates, passionate, <laughs> right? Willing to bring change to our society for all, and the benefit for all. Well, in August 1889, Luis Carlos Galán was assassinated. In March 1990, Bernardo Jaramillo was assassinated. In April, 1990, a month later, Carlos Pizarro was assassinated. So by the time I went to the police station in June 1990, none of my choices have survived. At a time when I want to feel freedom, I actually feel fear and frustration. And this 
not only happened to me, but to millions around the country. So instead of just remain sad, we decided to share our frustration in the streets. And that's why we made a choice. We decided not only to look at our political figures in posters in museums, but actually to come together and figure out what to do. Thousands, I would say millions of people coming from all sides of the country decided to protest against Pablo Escobar of the Cartel and Medellin, who was pointed as the one responsible of this massive killing. Not only of politicians, but also journalists, teachers, judges, innocent civilians. Uh, but it was interesting to me that clearly he was pointed out as one responsible person. But the media kept talking about black forces. Some black forces are trying to destabilize the country throughout this massive violence and narco-terrorism. We come together in what we call the National Student Movement. In the first place, just to share our frustration, to start talking about that to begin to think about what options we could have. How could we deal with this situation? After hours of discussion with different people, intellectuals, politicians, all sorts of people, the National Student Movement came up with an idea. And that was called the Septima Papeleta, the Seventh Valley. It was an open consultation if, to see if people were allowed to elect a new assembly that could build a new political pact new rules for political competition that could actually guarantee people that if they want to run, they can do it safely instead of being killed. And the political regime in general was going to be more fair and, and, and open for competition. And many other changes, uh, changes that in social terms and economic terms were also important. Although this was not an uh, official ballot, it was counted on the pool. And it got, he, it, 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 this, this uh, proposal got about 2.5 million votes. So now our student proposal came from a sort of idea into a national political debate. And later on, it went up to a presidential priority. Finally, sort of a, a year later, a national assembly was elected. And some months later, they enacted a new Colombian constitution. Colombia's 1991 constitution is widely recognized as one of the most progressive political and democratic achievements in Colombia's history. And I was so proud to be part of it. So up to this point, what I've learned about the power of voice. Well, first of all, I learned that this is not always about leadership. It's many times about followership. You know, we all are taught to be leaders. But actually, we can accomplish anything if nobody is willing to follow the leader's idea, right? So followers not always get the glory and the recognition, but they are the key ones to make anything happen, right? So that's one thing. The best way to lead sometimes is just fellowship commitment. That's it. The second thing that I've learned is that the power of voice is not about volume. It's about direction. It's about being able to transform uncertainty into feasible options, right? That's the third thing that I've learned. By that time, I was 20. And I learned that, yes, some cowards have the power to kill, but we all have the power to speak. And that makes a difference. So life goes on. I finished my university. I went out to work for different fantastic jobs, for example, with the mayor of Bogota, and later on with the United Nations, for example. And so I traveled around South America. I did consultant services and local governance and development. That was a fantastic year. But I, I was pretty much abroad Colombia. After probably seven years of being either working hard or working outside Colombia, I decided to come back to my country. And decided to be a policymaker and an urban manager. That's what I love. 
That was my choice. But by the time I came, uh, a friend offered me to have a weekly column in uh, Semana.com, that's the most uh, read uh, Columbus magazine. So I said, well, this might be nice, but why not? It's a sort of an aside kind of charming idea. I will take it. Uh, thinking and looking for a topic to write about, I decided to turn on the TV. And suddenly, what I saw was four paramilitary leaders speaking before Congress. Some of these guys were the same guys that I saw through a decade as drug traffickers, as mafia cops. Now they were with ties, giving speeches, and being applauded in Colombian Congress. I couldn't believe it. I was speechless. If some, I, I called my editor. I said, look, Juanita, if somebody told me days ago that I was going to watch this on TV, I thought it was a joke. But actually, it's happening. How is this possible? I don't understand. She told me, you know, life is complicated, Claudia. <laughs> life is complicated. This is very complex. You have too much to understand and to learn. Let me give you a brief idea. These paramilitaries, yes, they are horrible, they are violent, all, all, all we want. But precisely because of that, our government is trying to deal with them in political terms so we can bring peace, all right? Uh, that's the basic idea, the bottom line. All, all of the rest, if you want to report about it, I'll be happy to help you in any way. And I said, OK. So let's see, these drug traffickers are now presenting themselves as patriots who saved Colombia from communism uh, and asking us to be grateful. We went throughout the country. We interviewed dozens of people. We listened to all kinds of stories, places in which guerrilla uh, prevented people from voting, preventing candidates from campaigning, some other places in which drug traffickers and paramilitary groups actually forced people to vote. We were plenty of testimonies. But we knew for sure that we can use and rely only on testimonies. First of all, because that's what not you're supposed to do as a journalist. You have to have different sources, right? Uh, and second of all, because it was risky for them. So we start looking at data. What if we look at, uh, let's say, um, indicators of violence, indicators of massacres, indicators of homicides, and all kinds of stuff in the last 10 years. And also about electoral results. I want to know where these Congress members that were applauding these paramilitary guys as cheerleaders, how do they get elected, actually? So after a while, we got up to these kind of maps. So this map here, the darker the color, it means the higher is the presence of guerrilla groups and less people vote. So on this map, you have guerrilla attack. And on, on this map, you have people torn out, total torn out. So the darker the color, the less people vote. Just to give you a rough idea how it works. Like 50% of Colombians that actually can vote, vote. Okay? But in these municipalities of dark color, less than 50% of people allowed to vote actually vote. And if you combine the two maps, it's of such an interesting coincidence, right? So the more present the guerrilla is, the less people can vote. And the more sabotage against the whole process of elections uh, uh, is caused. The other thing that we found out is that there are some places in which suddenly, by the 2002 congressional election, some candidates became sort of rock stars. Many of them didn't have any kind of political record. They didn't have any kind of uh, political fault before. This was the first time they were running. And suddenly, they looked like Mickey Mouse in some town. Right? They got, were able to get up to 90, 95 percent of total vote in a political competition in which a thousand candidates are running. So it was like nobody else's exit. Right? And on the other map, again, are heavy attacks of paramilitary groups. 
by the same kind of measures. Homicides, massacres, false displacement, so on and so forth. And again, we combine the maps. And guess what? What a coincidence. So precisely those places in which the higher the paramilitary presence is, the higher Mickey Mouse candidate seems to be, right? So here is the hard choice. We decided to publish the whole list of the names of these candidates. And also to build up the sort of political structure, who was behind them, who supported them, right? Where do they come from? When we have all these data, and I call my editor again, and she said, you know what? We're going to make news. We're going to hit the headlines. Everybody's going to love this report. It is going to be out there forever. Guess what? Nobody called. Nobody called. Nobody wants to publish it at the first time. Even in our own magazine, they were only allowed to publish it online, but not in the paper section, which is always obviously the most read it. And he always said things like, it's complicated. <laughs> so, well, we were full of frustration. But finally, like there are four months, a Supreme Court justice called. And he said, look, we are willing to have an open formal investigation of likely ties between politicians and drug traffickers and paramilitary groups. But we need your testimony before court to be able to use your research as a sort of criminal hypothesis. So we did. After six months, the first six Congress members were arrested. After two years, all the 22 Congress members that spoke such as cheerleaders at that congressional session were sentenced guilty and in prison. Up to now, roughly 35 Congress members elected in 2002 have been prosecuted under charges of criminal drug enterprise with paramilitaries. So what we learn about this? First of all, there is not such a thing as black forces, right? Everybody has a name has a body, has an ID, even more if they are killing people. There is, uh, the important thing is to understand what, who's behind and what's happening, right? And the darker the issue, the brighten the light of your voice, and that's powerful. The second thing that we understand and that I, I learned through this process is that the power voice is not about the ability to speak, but it's mostly about the ability to listen. The third thing that I've learned through this process is that the power of voice is not about causing personal impression, you know. It's about building collective sympathy, such basic thing. <coughs> and the last thing that I've learned is that this is not about heroism or strategies very sophisticated. It's basically about simple acts of courage, conscience, and decision. I'm Claudia Lopez. I'm policymaker by choice and investigative journalist by chance. And this was my report of today. Thanks for listening. <laughs>